Now, on to the coronation. Uh, we understand that King Charles is, is in a little bit of a tussle with some of the organisers because he'd like multi-faith representation at the coronation. Now, apparently that's not gone down well, has it? Yes, uh, particularly not very well with Justin Welby, who is the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, um, because it's in it, it's in a direct conflict with the canon law, which actually states that members of different faiths cannot actually give a, a speech at the coronation. Now, obviously, with these things, it's always a tightrope, because Britain is, of course, a very diverse and multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-faith society. And so you want all groups of, of people within Britain to feel adequately represented. But it's about pushing the boundaries. Obviously, now that King Charles is the monarch, he is the defender of the faith. Uh, he's the head of the church. But he also has to make room for the fact that there are different faiths coexisting in Britain. Um, I do find it a bit ironic that it's Justin Welby who finds uh, his uh, attempts to bring in other faiths quite inappropriate. Because as Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, Justin Welby has made very many inappropriate political comments himself. So I find that quite ironic. But obviously, we'll just have to see how far he can push the envelope. You still want to keep things traditional while, um, you know, paying homage to the fact that Britain has changed very drastically as a society since the Queen's coronation in the 50s. Yeah, and that's not the only uh, break with tradition, I suppose. Charles is also inviting 850 community leaders to the coronation. Um, is that just another expression of that representation of community? Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that has always been consistent with King Charles is the fact that he has always tried to emphasise, you know, bringing communities together and showing the best of Britain as opposed to kind of highlighting what divides us. I, I don't think that's very out of character for him. Um, he's always been like this. His mother has always been like this as well. So it's, it's at least comforting to know that he is sticking in that same vein and trying to keep up with tradition. Now, on to Fergie. She's become quite the thrower of truth bombs in the royal family. And I must say, it suits her very well. Now, she's not <laughs> held back at the Sussexes trying to have their cake and eat it as well, has she? Absolutely not. Uh, I mean, this week she gave uh, an interview uh, to The Independent where she said that being in the royal family, you have to be all in or all out and you can't sort of have one foot in and one foot out, which was uh, clearly a dig at the Sussexes because that's what they ideally wanted. They wanted to be able to have their life in North America whilst playing some sort of contributor role, like a social media influencer with the royal family, which is just not how the firm works. Um, but she made it very clear that it's something that you really have to be wholly dedicated to. And she understands this because she was an active uh, working member of the royal family for a decade. Um, so she understands the sacrifices that it takes. Um, but it also shows that to be in, in the royal family, there's a level of selflessness that you have to have. You cannot be arrogant. You cannot think that you're so important that you can just have one foot in and one foot out. I mean, in the book, um, Rob, um, Rob John, uh, Jobson's book, he makes... Uh, uh, note to the fact that the Sussexes really kind of wanted to craft their own role and actually went to the press and released uh, their statement that they were leaving the royal family to be, be able to have some sort of leverage when they ultimately had this summit with the Queen and other members of the royal family to discuss how they were going to make it work. So they were arrogant enough to believe that they, 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 they had a final say on this and that they could actually shoehorn their, their desires into the royal family. And again, again, that clearly didn't turn out how they wanted it to. But, you know, Fergie is just making the point that many of us have made, which is you're either in the royal family or you're not. You can't cherry pick the aspects of, of royal life that you would like. You can't say that you, you want to be in the royal family or out of it and then, you know, get all the benefits of being a royal working member, like the level of security that other members of the royal family enjoy. Mm. Now, it's also been reported this week that Charles is supporting a study into the royal family's historical links to slavery. Why do you think he's doing that, and particularly at this time? Well, I think he's been caught between a rock and a hard place. I think if he if he didn't support that sort of inquiry or investigation, you know, that wouldn't have gone down too well. And I think a part of him just accepted that because of the closeness of the coronation and not to have any sort of scandal um, tarnishing that upcoming event. But I think the reality is this could actually serve as a golden opportunity for him to say, look, we found these, you know, our links to the to slavery as 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 the royal family, and but we also have to highlight that Britain was uh, one of the countries that 
abolished slavery first and that we have to learn from our mistakes and move on from it. He actually has the opportunity to make a statement and highlighting the nuanced realities of slavery, the fact that it wasn't unique to, to one country and it's always existed in the human condition. He can make examples of the fact that, you know, Ethiopia kept slavery going in society up until the 1940s when the British pressured Haile Selassie into ending it formally. You know, this is a very nuanced discussion and I think he can actually bring some common sense back into the room as opposed to just kowtowing and going down the, the route of the Laura Trevelyans who are actually paying money to, to Caribbean governments to atone for her sins, allegedly. And I think, and I think, common sense will be really important here because if it's if it's not um, messaged correctly, it could end up being a real own goal for the royal family. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I think he needs to take quite a definitive stance on this. Um, but I think most most people can read the room and understand that there's no point harking on about this because there are no slavers or slaves alive today. And the only people that are benefiting from this are people that didn't actually experience any form of slavery at all, not even them or their, their parents or their grandparents. And so clearly the conversation does become quite redundant when you see how impossible it is to really rectify uh, the wrongs of the past. Mm. Now, uh, just uh, on to Princess Kate for a moment. Um, it's been re reported this week that she found the interaction with the Sussexes at the Windsor walkabout following the Queen's funeral as very difficult. Um, this isn't particularly surprising, is it, given where that relationship's got to? Of course. I mean, there were always sort of murmurings within the media that the relationship between the Sussexes and the Cambridges had had really broken down at the time. Um, and, you know, Kate made uh, very clear that she wanted an apology from Meghan because Meghan accused her of having baby brain when she said something while she was pregnant, which she found deeply offensive. Obviously, Meghan made it clear in, in her Netflix documentary that she found Kate uptight when they first met uh, because somehow she didn't want to hug her while she was barefooted and dressed casually when she'd never met her before. So clearly that relationship had broken down uh, quite significantly already. And obviously the walkabout was not her idea, it was her husband, Prince William's idea. So she had to go along with it because it was seen as extending an olive branch. But I can imagine it's quite difficult for someone to, to, to play nice pl publicly with people that have had no qualms in slating you and defaming your character in the way that they have done, even before the, the, the Netflix documentary and their book was released. Um, so I can imagine it's quite difficult. And this is one of the things that comes with this sort of job because you're, 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 you're so fixated uh, in the public life, for, for example, you really don't have a choice. You have to get on with the job. You have to keep calm and carry on, even when you have people literally right next to you that have no qualms with, with defaming your character to the media. Mm. Now, one last thing before we go. There's been a couple um, of reports this week in relation to the coronation. Uh, first, that the RSVP dates have passed and Harry and Meghan are yet to advise uh, the royal family whether or not they're going. Uh, and the second thing is that, in fact, only working royals will be on the balcony. Uh, it feels like this is a bit of game playing and a bit of, bit of chicken going on here. Um, I suspect that the Sussexes won't make an appearance um, just because I think the, the message is very clear that they're not welcome. Obviously, their security issues and their, their lawsuit with the Home Office is still ongoing. I personally hope they're not there just because I feel like this is not, a, you know, a, an, a, an occasion for Netflix cameras. It is a national event and we'd like to keep it that way. We'd like to keep the tawdry, um, gossipy uh, sort of stories out of the tabloids and focus on what really matters. Um, and also, it would, it would be an extremely poor taste if they did choose to come, even though the RSVP date has passed. Um, it's clear that their only uh, sort of source of income really relies on their proximity to the royal family. But I suspect, you know, we will be getting more information from, from the release of, of the book, Our King, this week, that really they are now outsiders and they have no place in the royal family. Their proximity has it has now and truly been ended. You know, the, the, the monarch and his son are not even going to meet Harry uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis anymore. Um, they're going to be, you know, shrouded with sort of uh, guests in the room and lawyers and all these, these other people people that they think will keep them safe from the Netflix cameras and all the invasions of privacy that the Sussexes have engaged in. Um, so, you know, I, I do personally hope that they don't attend just because I think we're all sick of this drama. But I also think it would have been extremely poor taste if they do. Mm. Yeah, there's, I feel like this is a lose-lose situation. Anyway, Esther, that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll chat to you again soon.